coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Dr. Kiki answers your questions. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode number 112, recorded on Thursday, September 8th, 2011. An open book. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome everyone to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford and this is episode 112. The numbers keep going up and up and up and it's so exciting because that just means there are more and more hours of science for you to listen to, watch, and learn about. But in this hour's show, as always, I hope you're ready to, di to dig into our one hour, one topic, one expert. The subject of today's show, me. That's right, it's me. I'm going to answer your questions about my career, life, science, otherwise. The whole point is that uh, a lot of people ask, uh, ask for information about me. And I don't know that I've ever sat down and just kind of answered your questions. So today, you are the interviewer. So get ready to ask your questions. But first, as always, a few science headlines. In the news today, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory allowed scientists to discover a late phase to solar flares that's never been observed before. The late phase occurs in 15% of solar flares and a half an hour to several hours later, the EVE instrument, that's short for Extreme Ultraviolet Variability, on the SDO recorded four phases for the average solar flare, where only, uh, where uh, recorded four phases where only three had been recorded previously. Sorry, I was missing a word there. Suggesting that massive amounts of energy that can impact the Earth are going untracked and sometimes underestimated by as much as 70%. Planets normally orbit around their stars like clockwork, unless, of course, another large body is exerting an influence on it. Reporting on data collected by the Kepler spacecraft in the Astrophysical Journal, astrophysicists have found what they call an invisible planet. Kepler 19c could be rocky and on a quick circular orbit or gaseous and on a larger oblong orbit around its star. Either way, it's tugging on planet Kepler 19b, making it alternate, alternately slow down and speed up. And the scientists are patiently waiting for the invisible planet to become visible at some point. For the first time, scientists used radio waves to determine the location of the black hole at the center at the center of galaxy M87. They mapped six specific frequencies of radiation emitted within the radio jets that shoot out from the black hole and its accretion disk to determine the shape and structure of the jets. They used that information to infer the location of the base of the jets and then used a viewing angle to determine the exact location of the black hole. Easy as pie. Evidence from the nurse's health study suggests that moderate consumption of alcohol is part of successful aging. Whereas your definition might differ for this analysis, it was specified as survival to age 70 years, not having major chronic health disease, chronic disease such as coronary, coronary disease, cancer, stroke, or diabetes, and having no major cognitive impairment, physical impairment, or mental health problems. If you agree with that definition, it looks as though one to two and a half drinks per day on at least five days a week does a body good. A study in Current Biology reports that babies in utero show brain activity for pain as a separate unique sensation from general touch at 35 to 37 weeks of gestation. Babies are considered full term at 37 weeks. 
Greater Honey Guide chicks were shown to be brutal murderers of fellow nest mates on reality TV. Scientists put infrared cameras into the nests of bee eaters, another species of bird who are preyed upon by the greater honey guides, to view this behavior for the first time in 60 years. Adult honey guides are brood parasites and lay their eggs in the bee eater nests. The cameras showed the honey guide chicks hatching days before the bee eater chicks and while still blind, brutally stabbing the bee eater chicks as they emerged from their eggs with its sharp hooked beak. Interestingly, the honey guide spared its foster parents from its attack. Who said that nature was always pretty? Scientists are uncovering the secrets of parasites that control the behavior of their hosts. A Penn State University duo reported about, a, about the gene responsible for the strange behaviors compelled upon the gypsy moth caterpillar by a particular viral parasite called called LDMNPV, a baculovirus, in the journal Science this past week. The gene is called EGT, and it makes caterpillars climb to the treetops rather than hiding down in the understory. This is so that the virus can release itself into the air only to infect more unsuspecting caterpillars. California mantis shrimp, which live on the sea floor, were recorded communicating in synchronized rhythmic rumbles with individuals having their own voices. This is the first time the songs of wild shrimp have ever been recorded. Get ready to start eating the king crab. If you're hungry for crab, scientists have found large numbers of king crabs invading the sea floor near Antarctica. Increasing sea temperatures are implicated in the cause of this territorial shift, and there are, new, are significant concerns for the delicate Antarctic undersea ecosystems, which have evolved for millions of years without such a predator species. And finally, switching to natural gas from coal might not have the desired cooling effect on global climate, according, uh, according to a new study to appear in the journal Climate Change Letters. The author suggests that because burning coal also releases sulfates and particulate matter into the air, which block incoming sunlight, the CO2-led warming uh, the, co the coal should cause is lessened. Additionally, although changing to natural gas would reduce CO2 emissions, substantial amounts of methane leak from these drilling operations, which has short, a large short-term impact on climate forcing. The conclusion? It's complicated. But for those of you who like your life uncomplicated, Netflix makes TV and movie viewing easy. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to your TV to you instantly, which means that you save time, money, and hassle. There are several ways that you can instantly access streaming movies and TV shows. Uh, with Netflix, among them, you can use your Mac or your PC or your iPad, even the iPhone and some Android phones. Additionally, you can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on a gaming console like the Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii. It's right on your television if you're not a gamer, though, but you have a set-top box like the Apple TV or Roku box that are pretty inexpensive and easy to use. You can use those, too. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. And one of the fun things is that you can start on one device stop in the middle of the show or movie that you're watching, and then resume watching on a completely different device. And the great thing here, too, you can cancel any time that you like. Try Netflix today for 30 days for free. Go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up, sign up for your free trial, netflix.com forward slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of twit and Dr. Kiki Science Hour. And we hope that you enjoy watching Instantly with Netflix. All right, back to the show. It's time to bring in the guest expert. And that expert is me. So what are your questions? I want to know, chat room, what do you want to know about uh, my research past, scientific history, career history? Um, what do you want to know about me? I have a couple of questions that uh, are have come from Google+, Plus, but the chat room is springing into activity. Um, Strengths is asking, have I ever been to a psychic? His workmate or their workmate went to one last weekend to ask about a future work situation. Uh, 
<laughs> so you quit your job just to prove the psychic failed. She didn't predict that. So what is my former workmate still believe in them? Well, belief is something that is, uh, is hard to explain. And, um, I have never personally been to a psychic. However, uh, people in uh, within science, the research studies have failed to show that psychics are uh, any better at chance, at, any better than chance at predicting the future. Um, you know, why do people not believe in evolution? Why do people? Uh, you know, there are lots of things that people do. People have crazy beliefs. And that's not necessarily, that aren't necessarily supported by scientific fact. So myself, into a psychic? No. Every once in a while, I do enjoy reading the horoscope, though, and trying to figure out, you know, exactly how I can make that fit into my life. <laughs> how I can adjust my life so that it fits the horoscope. I don't know. Confirmation bias. It's all about confirmation bias. Rich. T U K asks if I got to go into space and spend one whole day on any planet of my choice, which planet would it be and why? Also, who would I take with me? Interesting question. Um, if I were go to, to go to any planet of my choice, assuming that the life support systems would be available so that if I were to go to that planet, I wouldn't just die from exposure. Um, I think it would be really interesting to, oh, wow, that's a really hard question. Mm. Okay, I'm thinking about that one. Uh, planet of my choice would be actually probably something like Enceladus, which isn't a planet per se, but actually a moon of a planet. Um, there are some really interesting things going on um, on some of the moons of uh, Saturn, moons of Jupiter, uh, that I think would be really interesting to see in terms of uh, how these planets, freezing, freezing cold planets, freezing, freezing cold moons, because they're so far away from the sun, um, how, they, uh, how they work, what they look like, in person. Um, I think that would be where I'd want to go. Who would I want to take with me? It would have to be somebody that I'd want to spend a lot of time with. Um, yeah, I like Tensor Guy in the chat room says, yes, Enceladus has a liquid moon, a liquid ocean. Um, so that would be under the surface. It would be interesting to see how that, how that works. Um, who would I like to take with me? I... Somebody I like to spend a lot of time with and won't get annoyed by over the long trip it would take to get there. So I'd probably want to take my family. I don't know. Maybe I'd take Kai. Taking, taking my son Kai would be great because then I could show him another, another uh, body in our solar system. That could be exciting. I think that would be a pretty exciting thing to do. All right. Um, how does an average day in the life of Dr. Kiki post Kai compare to an average day in the life of Dr. Kiki pre knock knocked up -edness? This is from Goldizator in the chat room. Um, and this, this also ties into a question that Mike underscore in the chat room has asked. Being a new mother rewires your brain. Going from independence to being a caregiver, there are mental changes that give the mother ability to protect her ability to care from the child. And how does this work? Okay, so average day in the life of Dr. Kiki compares. Now I spend a lot of time taking care of Kai. So um, now that I have a child, the average day, majority of the day is spent focused on him, uh, making sure that uh, he's getting interesting stimulation, that we're doing fun things that'll stimulate his brain and get his brain to grow in interesting ways, um, that uh, we're going out and adventuring and, uh, and he's being exposed to new things. Um, and so I think I'm spending a lot less time focusing on um, on science news and what's out there in the world and also a lot less time focused on me. And, you know, before Kai, I spent a lot of time trying to think up new show ideas and new things to do, uh, new projects that I could work on. And while those projects and things that I like to do are still happening and I'm still kind of working on stuff, um, 
I definitely am not spending this, the same amount of time as I used to doing that. Um, and so the question again about mental changes for Mike and how, how it works to be able for a mother to be able to uh, care for the child and how the brain changes. Uh, basically what you see happening is uh, a change in where synapses happen. So uh, probably an increase in synaptic formation. So the connection between two neurons uh, in different areas of the brain, those related probably to attention, um, uh, there's probably, and I don't know this for sure, I don't know that there's any scientific evidence for this. I do know that the uh, density of neurons increases when a woman, after a, a woman gives birth. So there is an increase in uh, synapses that happens. Um, but in, in terms of aspects of neuronal conductance, so whether or not the, con the neurons become quicker at conducting information. Uh, that's something that I don't know that anyone's shown uh, in the human brain, but uh, in differences between humans in their brains, you can see um, their actual, some people have faster neurons than other people. And so it would probably pretty, be pretty conducive to taking care of your kid to having faster neurons as well as more connections between them. But like I said, again, I don't know that that is actually, if there's anything that actually supports that. Um, but yeah, more synapses. My brain is dense. Um, it used to be a, a thing like a put down for people to, people to call you dense. Oh, you're so dense, you know, like a block of wood. But really, if you think of it, if they're talking about your brain being dense, that is a wonderful compliment, an incredible compliment. Um, Scrolling down through the chat room, um, someone, Mike Mike B asks, how did I get to know Justin Jackson? Justin Jackson is my co-host in uh, this week, on This Week in Science. And I met Justin Jackson probably uh, within a year of starting my undergraduate studies at UC Davis. So um, Justin, I believe, was in Los Angeles for a certain amount of time. Um, I went to a cafe called Cafe Roma in Davis where the townies hung out um, and met townies. Justin was a, he grew up in Davis. He went to LA, came back. When he came back, he was one of the townies. And I think that's how I met him. Yeah, that was about it. Townies, Davis, small town. <laughs> um, let's see, another question from Hot Rod. <laughs> what was in the first flask I dropped? Uh, formaldehyde. I'll have to say it was probably, it was formaldehyde, um, which is a nice mutagenic if you're interested. Um, am I an atheist? No, I am not an atheist, Castle. Um, are there going to be any new food science episodes, asks Titus. Um, at this point in time, there are not going to be any new food science episodes, but uh, Food Science, which is a video show uh, uh, talking about food science that I did several years ago now with Alex Lindsay of the Pixel Core, um, that is now up on Hulu, so you can watch those episodes if you haven't before. Um, but I don't know, if somebody wants to wants to throw some funding at me, to make new episodes of food science, I think that uh, I think that we could do a great job. And you know, why not? If the money came and there was a, de a demand for it, I would love to do more. And uh, the reason that it, it ended early was that we ran out of funding. Um, not lack of interest on our part. Uh, What else are people asking about? Um, what is my major? Well, I'm no longer in school, but when I was in school, my undergraduate major was uh, wildlife fisheries and conservation biology. I actually, um, I, I was I was leaving school with a bachelor bachelor of science. Um, probably, I was thinking maybe of going out and doing wildlife management, park rangering. I don't know something like that. And then I got interested in birds during my senior year. Um, and my, that interest in birds led to me getting my PhD in um, molecular, cellular, and integrative physiology with a focus on neurophysiology and behavior. So uh, my specialty is in avian brains or bird brains. 
Uh, Kiki Fan is asking if it was possible to clone me. Would I, would I allow it? Probably not. Um, a clone of me would not be the exact me because environmental influence um, is really significant in the development and the formation of an individual. So even though the genetic information might be the same, there might be epigenetic signatures that would be affected and also environmental aspects um, that could not be replicated. So the clone would really not be a clone. Sorry. Uh, Simply Charlie is asking if, uh, what is my look on the future? Am I an optimist or a pessimist? I have to say, I err on the side of being an optimist. I do. I have a lot of faith in humanity, maybe to a fault. Um, I believe that we, our, intel- our, our intellect is something that can do great things and that inspired people, motivated people, and there are many of them in the world today who are linked by the uh, wonderful technology of communication, uh, the internet that we have today. Uh, So many great things can be done, and I, I am an optimist about change and about the future uh, being something that is that will be a great place, a great, a great time to exist. The future is unknown. It's it, uh, which is always exciting. Uh, Random is asking, when did I know I was going to be a scientist? So um, I think I wanted to be a scientist from a fairly early age. I mean, um, I was always doing science fairs as a kid, um, really getting into uh, how things worked. Um, taking, I took some extra classes at a junior college when I was in high school. I just was really always interested in science. Um, I, I guess the question of whether or not I was going to be a scientist, that really solidified during college um, and going through lab classes and and getting, I, there were some great field biology classes that I took that I really loved. And um, those were highly, highly um, influential in in my becoming a scientist. So I think when, did I know I was going to be a scientist? Probably college, because that was when I really got on my scientist track. Um, But I was always into science from a very young age. But that said, I was also into communications from a very young age. So while I was doing uh, a lot of science courses in high school and getting into it in college, college, I also got into radio. I was doing yearbook and drama in high school. Um, I mean, one of my young memories is being a kid with a little uh, tape recorder with a microphone and uh, pretending to be a radio commentator over a uh, little... A, uh, a slot car <laughs> racing track. We had uh, my brother and I had slot car a slot car race track that we got for Christmas one year, along with the microphone and and tape recorder, and that was something that was a lot of fun to me. So I, I tried writing a play. I tried writing books. I was I was very into communicating and science. So um, all this stuff were parts of my were, were my interests from from very fairly young ages. Um, it was during college, though, that I really got into radio, like I said, and it was doing radio at KDVS at UC Davis, the campus radio station, that really got me started. I started doing a music program there uh, for four years. I did I did music, uh, I did just a music radio program, uh, folk, Americana, roots, rock, that kind of stuff. And then uh, it was... After my undergrad, kind of in one of the in-between years, between undergrad and grad school, that I started doing This Week in Science as a radio show, public affairs show on KDBS. It was an idea that a friend and I had one summer when we were drinking beers and sitting in the hot Davis heat talking about um, black holes and quasars and the brain and uh, chemistry and uh, atomic physics, you know, all sorts of things that we thought just were interesting and we were just just talking about. And we we're like, why don't we do this on the radio? Someone someone will want to hear us talk about it. And so I started that started the show with a good friend, Ted Dunning, 
And then this week in science is still alive and well, although now with Justin Jackson, um, who those of you who listen to the show will uh, will know and hopefully love. He's a he's a wonderful guy. Um, let's see. I am way behind the chat room. Oh, how did how did I end up doing doing work with Leo? That's a really good question. So this week in science, we started it as the radio show, like I said, then technology started evolving and we started recording it. First, we were recording it on cassette tape down at the radio station. Um, and then we started moving into, we moved into, um, oh gosh, what were we? We had little discs that we were recording it on. And then we moved into recording it as MP3s and then putting those MP3s up on a website where people could download them. And then, oh my goodness, iTunes came along and we could make a podcast. Um, so we had, we actually had a podcast going before iTunes launched, but it was very exciting to be able to put ourselves in the iTunes library. And then, wow, it was so exciting. Um, podcasting and new media started becoming a thing. And so there was a podcasting conference. And so I went to this podcasting conference and I ran into Alex Lindsay, who was there as part of This Week in Tech. And I said, hey, you're This Week in Tech. I'm This Week in Science. And Alex said, we should do some video stuff together about science. And I said, hey, that's a really great idea. And so Alex and I did some work together enjoyed working together, made food science, and uh, did some other work. And Alex said, I'd like to introduce you to Leo Laporte. Leo does This Week in Tech and blah, blah, blah. And I, of course, I knew of Leo by then, but Alex made the introduction and um, Leo and I started talking and Leo said that he really wanted to support science on his network and that he thought science was a very important um, important endeavor and a very important thought process and uh, type of information to get across to people. So he said, we, should, we could do a science show. Do you want to do a science show? We have Futures in Biotech, but it would be great to do a, a different kind of science show that has a, a slightly different take on things. And that's how it got started. And I think, gosh, what year was that? I don't remember what, what year it was. I mean, it was a couple of years ago now. A couple of years ago now. Or three or four, something like that. But anyway, yeah, a while back. And um, that is history. So I've been working with Leo um, for a couple of years and having a lot of fun adding science to his tech lineup. Because, you know, Tech is really science applied. Um, let's see. Ed Dyer had a question from Google Plus. Was there a life-changing moment when I knew I did not want to work in a lab anymore? Um, I have to say that there actually was a life-changing experience. It wasn't incredibly life-changing, but it was... Well, it was life changing, not in the way that it was like, you know, it wasn't an injury or anything like that. But um, my advisor for grad school, she had a job opportunity in England at Cambridge University. And she is originally from, was originally from England. She said uh, that she was going to move her lab to Cambridge, but uh, she couldn't take anybody with her. So um, two years into my PhD work, I was left without a lab and um, without any place to do my research and uh, kind of kind of up a river without a paddle, so to speak. Anyway, I, um, at that point, I didn't really know what to do. I started reaching out to other scientists to try and uh, other researchers at UC Davis to try and figure out. I started even looking at other universities to see if I wanted to maybe use, uh, work at a different university someplace else. Um, but I was kind of falling in love at the time, you know, love of love changed things. Anyway, I took a year off and moved to San Francisco. I said, I'm just going to leave school behind for a year, move to San Francisco. I got a job working at UCSF in a neuropsychopharmacology neuro lab doing drug trials on humans, um, uh, looking at uh, co effects of cocaine and heroin and other stuff. Um, and did that for a year, which was awesome. Really, really enjoyed it. Enjoyed that. But the whole time was kind of like, oh, what am I doing? I'd left This Week in Science 
in the hands of Ted Dunning and another friend, Greg Yen, who has also appeared on This Week in Science this last year, uh, if you remember that episode. Um, they were doing the show, and I just was like, man, I really miss doing the show. And it was leaving the show behind that made me realize how much I enjoyed communicating science. And that twist was really the thing that I wanted to do. And so I uh, went back to UC Davis to complete my dissertation with the goal of not going on to continue in academic research, but to have credibility as a scientist, as somebody who has worked in a lab, who knows the scientific process, who's published, who's come gone from idea to published paper, who knows who has kind of seen how it goes, who's tried to get funding and failed or succeeded. Um, all of these, all these things I thought were really important. And so I wanted my doctor to be, doctorate to be real. I wanted to be able to go out into the world and be Dr. Kiki. I want to be Dr. Kiki and not as Google Plus wants me to be Kiki Sanford. Because I, I spent a long time uh, <laughs> working to get that that doctorate degree. And it's a very um, important degree to me. It's a very important thing that I did during a period of my life. And it has helped me to become who I am. Um, let's see. Um, other questions. Uh, Ed Dyer also asked, was Twist my first experience in public speaking? And how nervous I was I um, for the first episode? Um, Twist was not my first experience public speaking. I'd done a lot of drama and other stuff in high school that I that I mentioned. Additionally, uh, teaching in graduate school, uh, teaching as an undergraduate and also um, in grad school. Um, yeah, it was not the first public speaking that I did. Um, I'd had a lot of experience prior. However, I will say that This Week in Science, uh, you can listen to old episodes and the way that I speak is entirely changed now as a result of my experience doing twists. Um, the, the lilt of my voice, the way I end questions, the uh, word whiskers, things are changed. And so it's kind of fun to go back. I've gone back a couple of times and I cringe. I honestly cringe because I was not very good when I first started. And yes, I was nervous because it was a new thing to do. So yeah, I have a lot to thank Twist for. Um, Darth Emma asks, have I ever considered a faculty position? And yes, I have considered a faculty position. Um, getting into podcasting and doing media is hard because it's a new thing. Um, and going from new media into and trying to maybe get into television and do lots of other projects. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work. And a faculty position, I've always thought, you know, it, it, during the lean times when it's been hard to come by a job, hard to come by um, uh, sponsors and funding, which of course is probably no difference, different from a faculty position. Um, you know, it's it's been something that I've thought about, and I've I've considered wanting to go back to to the academic life. It, it's the academic life is fabulous. Um, it's difficult, but it's fabulous. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do, I've I've often wondered though, or thought maybe if I were to go back to a faculty or faculty position at a university, maybe it wouldn't actually be for uh, physiology or neurophysiology, actually just doing um, uh, animal or brain research, but maybe uh, it would be something to do with science and new media communication, because that is something that I'm really passionate about now. Although, you know, anything about brains, I love brains. I would love, I the one thing I, I miss about what I do now is that there are all these different topics, which is really fun, but it's very surface. I don't get the chance to dig deep and really envelop myself in a topic. One piece of information, uh, one niche of, or topic about something like, you know, spatial learning and memory in the bird brain. It's a very narrow topic. It's, um, yeah, it's something that, that I do miss. So maybe I need to write a book so I can delve deeply once again. 
Um, uh, Mike, Mikey Fly is asking if I got into migration and navigation abilities when I studied bird brains. And yes, I did get into that a little bit. Uh, I looked at different species, migratory species of birds versus um, n nomadic species of birds. Uh, and I didn't really look at, it was mostly the, the research side of things, rather the the book learning, the looking at papers and seeing what was in the literature as opposed to my doing any studies on um, on things like magnetic field lines. Uh, what I was looking at was the hippocampus, the area of the brain that's responsible for spatial learning and memory. And so um, looking at differences between migratory and nomadic and birds that uh, stay in one, one place, the differences in the hippocampus between those birds, um, there were there were differences in cell density and uh, neurogenesis, which is also um, birth of new cells seasonally versus in in the migratory species uh, versus the other birds. So birds that seem to uh, that migrate, they have this seasonal behavior. Their brains, their hippocampus, seem to change on or at least the relative size of the hippocampus and cell density seem to change compared to uh, the whole volume of the brain in those birds and not so much in the nomadic birds. Uh, so that's something that was that was pretty interesting. Uh, and birds do have a sense of magnetic fields, yes. Um, I don't know whether some birds are better than others. I would guess that um, that migratory birds are probably a more astute at sensing those those field lines because they actually use them for migrating. Um, let's see. Did I, oh, do, do I have a mentor or someone that I look up to? Yeah, I've had a few mentors. Um, the, my, my original um, uh, PI in graduate school, um, the, the, the people who, the, then the PIs who took me on later. Uh, so Nicola Clayton, she studies avian learning and memory. She's now at Cambridge University. Uh, Gabrielle Nevitt, she studies uh, a, a olfaction and she looks, she's a neuroethologist and she looks at birds and fish as well. She's done some really interesting studies involving tampons that you might want to look into. Um, Tom Hahn, he was, is an amazing um, ecologist, ethologist at UC Davis. Um, he works on the white crowned sparrow um, and Vladimir Pravosudov, who's now at the University of Nevada, Reno. He's an amazing scientist. Um, he has um, it, the kind of brain that I wish I could just copy, take notes on. Um, an amazing, amazing scientist and good at getting money <laughs> for his research. Um, yeah, I had some wonderful mentors. Additionally, um, oh, I'm totally blanking on the name. That's him. Oh, here we go. Max Gomez, Dr. Max Gomez. He was the medical and health reporter at WNBC in New York City when I did a, um, a fellowship there. And he started out as a neurophysiologist, went into radio, ended up in television, very similar kind of career path. Um, and although, you know, definite differences in, in the way he does things, but he was a great, great mentor for learning how to write for TV. Um, let's see. So yeah, some really great mentors. And I have to say, Leo, Leo has been very influential. Alex Lindsay also. Um, there are some amazing people that I have to thank for, for um, everything I've learned. Um, not, and I have lots more to learn. So I'm sure I'm going to have many more amazing mentors as I move forward. Um, and hopefully, I hope that I uh, am able to mentor some uh, people who come up in media behind me. Let's see. If I, Gord McLeod is asking if I were to write a book, what topic would be my first consideration? So uh, I think my first consideration would have to be something to do with animal brains uh, because that's what, uh, what I know a lot about from my graduate work. So uh, spatial spatial navigation, spatial learning, memory. I think, I think that could be a really interesting book to write about. But I've also thought about um, books on, 
on the future. So taking what we know about the current state of science and kind of prognosticating on you know, where those fields are going to go and how they'll, how they'll affect the future. And like, um, like Golda Zader mentioned earlier in the chat room, I did have an idea on a zombie neuro book that I have yet to write. So yes, the brain science of zombies. Brains. I think that would be fun. Yeah. So anyway, those are, those are some, you know, fun ideas. Uh, Tensor Guy asks, how is Dr. Michio Kaku in person? He is a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, on camera, his answers are very pat and he's been media trained very well. So he knows how to give a sound bite for the camera. So if you're uh, looking at multiple interviews of Dr. Kaku over a number of different programs, you'll often see that the answers he gives are very similar. Um, in person though, he is uh, very, he's very friendly. He thinks a lot about, um, about science, education, all the issues that he talks about on his blog and other things. And he's, I think he's, I, I've only, you know, sat and talked with him for a couple of hours. So that's a very short amount of time, but he was a very gracious, generous person uh, during that time. Uh, let's see what other questions. Should I scroll down the chat room? I'm sure I missed a whole bunch of questions. If I missed your question, make sure that you uh, repeat it because I'm just going to try and scroll down as the chat room is moving fairly quickly. Um, Rich T UK says, I'm not sure if you have mastermind in the USA, but if you were invited on the show, what would you choose as your specialist subject if you could not choose science? Hmm. Now that is interesting. If I could not choose science, I think my specialist subject would be oh, communications. Does that would that work? It's kind of it's not as interesting though. <laughs> not necessarily. I don't know. That's that's a that's a good one. Mm, hula hooping. That's, that's more my superpower. Okay, um, scrolling down. Do I have a favorite scientific book that I'd like to recommend? I love The Black Hole Wars by Leonard Susskind. I know that's a, probably a couple of years old now, but great book. It's a really, really great book. Um, another book that I thought was really fun as I look... Mm, there are some other there are some other fun bones uh, fun books that take um, uh, take people and science and kind of uh, interlace them. Descartes' Bones is another fun one. Uh, Passionate Minds is really a fun book. Uh, it's scientists and artists of the writers of the uh, kind of the Renaissance era. It's a very passionate minds. It's a it's a love story. It's really fun. Um, okay, Hartwell is asking a question. Do I ever get fan mail? Let's have, that's meant for Kiki Stock Hammer. Um, that's a fun question. Um, once upon a time, I did get mail that was that somebody thought I was Kiki Stock Hammer as opposed to being Doctor Kiki. Um, and but I don't remember. The, the, I don't remember the comment at all. Uh, it was, yeah, it was just an email. Somebody saying hi. Uh, speaking of Kiki Stockhammer, on one of the old This Week in Science compilation albums, we have a song by the band that Kiki Stockhammer is in. Um, that's fun. That's trivia. So let's see... Uh, given my vast knowledge of birds, could Alfred Hitchcock's Alfred Hitchcock's movie *The Birds* ever happen? This is also from Hartwell. I don't think so. However, excuse me, that is based on the. It's based on the types of birds, and their normal behaviors. So, I mean, you could possibly get a bird with a strange parasite that would attack people or some reason there's a nesting colony that they, they look at humans as a threat and so the birds start attacking. But 
really, I, yeah, I'm not seeing that happen. So there are a lot of people out there with a fear of birds and large numbers of birds and being attacked by those birds. But um, I would guess that the probability of something like an event, uh, like the birds on the scale of the birds occurring, not, not very high, not very high. Uh, McT, you want to know if I can get Neil deGrasse Tyson on? Sure, I will attempt to get him on the show. How does that sound? Um, oh, Castle, here's a what somebody else says, too political question. Um, but I will, I will bite. What do I think of school boards that are against teaching evolution or requiring creationism to be taught side by side? I think that they are... Um, by requiring creationism or wanting to teach creationism, saying to teach both sides of the story or teach all, all stories, uh, they are doing a disservice to science. They don't understand science, and so they don't understand necessarily um, uh, the, or, or they are there, or some of the individuals are actively anti-science, which I don't personally understand, but there are individuals who are anti-science. Um, uh, they're absolutely doing a disservice to science. Uh, creationism is a belief. It is not held up by scientific evidence. You teach science in a science classroom. You teach religion or belief in a class about religions or beliefs. So if you want to talk about creationism, maybe that should happen in a science classroom. However, I think that um, in the science classroom, you can talk about the scientific method and what science is, um, and talk about the and talk about the fact. Use the creationism evolution debate as a teaching tool, um, but not necessarily to teach creationism to students. So students and their parents will uh, will believe what they want to, but what is taught in the cl classroom, the science classroom, should be science. And creationism is not science. Intelligent design is not science either. And so um, school boards that are, are pushing for those kinds of things to be in the classroom, the science classroom, they're not helping anything. And they're doing a massive disservice to the students and to the country as a whole. Okay, that's my big political statement. Um, oh, newer guys asking, what inspires me to go? I'd like to know about that. Gosh, I don't know if there's one specific thing because there are, it's the interest in, the basic interest in wanting to know how things work, how the universe works. Um, I... I, th I think that's that's really it. I just have curiosity about stuff. However, sometimes sometimes I do admit that when things end up with too many details, I do I do glaze over from time to time. It's true. We all do. We all do. There are we all have these the things that cause us to glaze over. Um, but I think that it's. I want to know how how the universe was built, how it's, how things work together. I want to know how animals uh, communicate with each other, how ecosystems work. Uh, there are, it's, I think it all comes down to a curiosity about, about how things work from the big to the small. That's basically it. Uh, Suds, where did, where did the name Kiki come from? My full name is Kirsten, and so um, a good friend started calling me K Key in college, Key Key, and then I had nephews, and the little baby nephews could say Kiki really easily, and so it kind of stuck. And everybody now calls me Kiki. Um, am I a fan of Quirks and Quarks? Yes, I am a fan of Quirks and Quarks. Absolutely, I'm also a fan of. Um, the ABC's science show hosted by Robin Williams. Is it Robin Williams? That's his name. Um, let's see. 
More questions scrolling on down. We have a couple more minutes left in the show. What species of bird is considered the smartest? Um, people are debating that because intelligence is actually pretty relative to um, uh, to the environment and to what the what the bird is up against in its fight for survival. So uh, smartest birds are thought to be New Caledonian crows right now because they are crows species of crow that has been observed with uh, uh, forming its own tools. So it has tool use and uh, tool use is thought to be something that separates primates from other species. But, you know, now we have tool use in a lot of other species. So that that line is blurring a bit. Um, New Caledonian crows, but many species of corvid, uh, including jackdaws, uh, American crows, ravens. Uh, additionally, um, another another family of birds are the um, uh, parrots. So the Ossian family parrots. Uh, the African gray parrot being one that's thought to be incredibly intelligent because of its uh, vocal communicative abilities. Um, can almost talk with people. You can teach it words, language. So it all depends. Different birds for different reasons. But corvids and parrots are thought to be among the smartest. Who are my favorite birds? Um, I have to say I like the bush tit. I do. Bush tits are small. They're cute. They're they're, they're the friendly birds. They kind of can hang out with lots of other birds, don't really get in fights with them a lot. They're pretty, pretty cute, awesome birds. Um, I also like, um, oh, there was another species of bird I just was thinking about the other day. Oh, well, that thought is gone. Sometimes the memories go away these days. Lack of sleep, it seems. Um, am I going to homeschool Kai? No. I will not homeschool him. I think that um, uh, social stimulation is very important. So I'd like to um, get him that. Although I think the, the choice of school and school district is going to be very important. But that's another question. Um, let's see more questions. It's always fun to scroll through the chat room. It moves so quickly sometimes. Uh, do I think any other animal than Homo sapien is intelligent? Absolutely. So like I said, um, there are very intelligent species of birds. It's just the difference in intelligence. So what is it that we define as intelligence? And what is, uh, and, and of course, as Homo sapien, as human, we define it according to our own intelligence, <clears throat> relative to our own intelligence. So um, yeah, there are many, 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 intelligent species. Dogs are amazingly intelligent. They have uh, ev evolved with humans for thousands of years. And so the way we're able to communicate with dogs specifically um, is amazing. And so that communication intelligence, the social intelligence of dogs fits well with people. Um, dolphins, very smart animals. They have pretty big brains. Um, birds, absolutely. And it, while you might pick specific species to call intelligent, within those species, there are going to be individual differences. So there are going to be really, really smart African gray parrots and really, really dumb African gray parrots. Just like in people, there is a bell curve, a, nat a natural distribution of intelligence across the spectrum. Um, I mean, even in the zebra finches that I spent many, many hours observing in the laboratory doing behavioral studies of spatial learning and memory, I have to say there were some really smart zebra finches. There were a bunch of really dumb ones too. And zebra finches as a group, you wouldn't necessarily consider maybe this as maybe the smartest bird. Um... Let's see, Hobbit from PA is asking, down the road, Kai comes to me and says he wants to get into a science field but doesn't know which and wants my suggestion. What is my answer? 20 years down the road, I think is a long time and I might have a completely different answer from what I say now. Um, I actually think a computational science um, degree would be uh, well worth the time at this point in time. Um, data management, computational science, there's a lot of stuff going on in uh, 
genetics, proteomics, uh, the Large Hadron Collider in physics, particle physics. There's a lot of data that needs to be crunched. And so I think that the future, uh, while there's going to be a lot of hands-on still field science and um, experimental science, a lot of a lot of stuff is going to be done on the computational side. So I think it might be a really smart area to get into. Um, that's what I say. So says Dr. Kiki. <laughs> <laughs> Scrolling down again. Um, is it true that children today are smarter? They seem to learn faster. Um, I doubt that they learn faster than they have. I think there's a lot more information and different kinds of information for them to pick up. And there's new technologies that allow them to be able to uh, pick things up more quickly. So I think a lot of it has to do with environment. However, there are studies that show that yes, indeed, people's IQs are higher by a few percentage points than they were 50 or 60 years ago. So maybe in fact, kids are getting smarter, but it could also have to do with the tests. And uh, Sword Edge says a better learning environment. I agree with that. Um, I think we're getting to the end of the hour. I can't believe this has come, come up so quickly. I just talked for a whole hour. You guys asked some great questions. Uh, there was another question from uh, Google Plus. Ven Stone asked what my favorite siege engine is. And I have to say that I think my favorite is a combination of the catapult to get things over the walls of a, <laughs> of, a, uh, of a fortress and, um, and diseased animals. So the fact that you could take a cow with smallpox or a, a human corpse with the black plague and throw it over a wall and potentially infect people, get them to run screaming out or to move away from an area because of the disease that they would be uh, affected by. It's, yeah, yeah, I think that's my favorite. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> um, uh, it's the end of the hour. Also, I think my babysitter has to go to class. She has a class that she needs to go to. Uh, Von Dutch is asking, uh, there's a discussion to separate girls and boys in some classes like math because they learn differently. Is this a good or a bad idea? Oh, that's a really great question. I think that the fact that they do learn differently is very important. However, uh, and, and we should uh, maybe bring different teaching methods into the classroom that allow us uh, to, uh, to use those different learning methods to our advantage. But I don't think separating boys and girls is necessarily a good idea because, you know, you're going to be, you're going to have to run up against men and women working together in this world for your entire life. Um, yeah, Web8029 says separate is never equal. I agree. I agree. Um, anywho, Rich T UK says another hour. <sighs> I, I wish I could. I wish I could. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed, enjoyed answering your questions. Um, so anyway, I think this is going to do it for the science hour. <gasps> and I forgot my science meditation video. I put, I posted it on Google plus. So maybe I will uh, post it in the chat room so that um, I'll get the link here. Copy link address. I'm going to put it in the chat room for everyone. And if Colin can play it at the end of the show, that would be fantastic. Um, and then let's go back to the end of the show here. Thanks to everybody for watching and asking questions and to being interested in uh, things things related to me, I guess. This is kind of weird. Kind of cool. Thanks for interviewing me. I really enjoyed being interviewed and all of your questions. Um, I do have to say I was more observant of the, of the questions that were asked by people who put uh, my handle, Dr. Kiki, D-R-K-I-K-I, -I, in the chat room. I should have said that earlier. So, uh it showed up in red, and so I was able to see that they were questions more easily. So the, uh, those are probably the questions that I, that I uh, answered more often. Um, 
I just want to say thanks again. It was really great. If you're interested in more Dr. Kiki stuff, you can go to uh, drkiki.tv, which is my website. You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Kiki, D-R-K-I-K-I. -I. Um, I'm also on Facebook as Dr. Kiki and on Google Plus as Kiki Sanford, because that's the way that Google Plus needs it to be. Um, if you want to email me, you can email me. I have an email account. It's Dr. Kiki at drkiki.tv. That's right, Dr. Kiki at drkiki.tv. Uh, you can subscribe to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour in iTunes, and you can find past episodes and also subscribe to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour at twit.tv forward slash kiki. So if there's an interview you're missing for whatever reason, go check out the library. There's 111 previous interviews to go through. If you need more science -y goodness, you can listen to This Week in Science at twist.org, also on Thursdays on the Twit Network. I'm going to see you next week. Thank you very much for tuning in to my science hour. All I ask is an hour a week, and remember, one hour a week makes your world a whole lot more interesting. And now for your science meditation. There Male you. hummingbirds perform fantastic courtship dives for females. Each species makes a different sound. Here are some examples. Most of the sounds I just played were made by the tail, and each species sounds different. They make the sound by spreading the tail one or more times when they dive. Each species has modified tail feathers, such as the inner tail feathers indicated here. I studied how the feathers make sound. In particular, I wanted to know how different shapes produce the sounds that the different species make, and whether feathers could interact with each other. This is a feather producing sound in the wind tunnel. Air flows from the left to the right. Rotating the feather makes it stop producing sound, and then start again. The trailing edge of the feather flutters to produce the sound, as this high-speed video shows. Here is an animation of the vibration of that feather. This is the fundamental frequency, which was about 1 kilohertz. And here is the second harmonic, which was about 2 kilohertz. Here is a feather with a different shape. Like before, rotating it activates or deactivates the mode of flutter. This high-speed video shows how it flutters. The feather's shape determines the way that it flutters, which determines what it sounds like. Orientation sometimes matters. This is the coolest feather I have tested so far, one of the tiny tail feathers of the white-bellied woodstar. Listen to how the pitch changes when I rotate the feather. This is their dive sound. In addition to shape, we tested whether feathers could interact. After all, all feathers have close neighbors. So, I tested the two outer tail feathers from the Anna's hummingbird. Feathers can amplify each other. When I rotate the larger feather away, the sound gets quieter. Here is a high-speed video of just the outer tail feather by itself. And here are the feathers together. This amplification effect is why the Anna's hummingbird's chirp is so loud. This is Chris Clark showing how hummingbirds sing with their tail feathers. <laughs>